to the book of 1 John and chapter number 2. 1 John and chapter number 2. Just as a matter of review, <clears throat> the marks of true fellowship, number one, are obedience. And number two is love. And number three is truth. It's important in your fellowship with God to have true fellowship. What you do, how you act, the behavior of your life. It is also important how you love God and how you treat His people and how you love the lost. But it's also very, very vital and important what you believe in relation to fellowship with God. There are all kinds of religions and all kinds of people today who claim that they've got a corner on God. Yet they do not embrace the Scriptures. Or they chop up the Scriptures and strip the Scriptures to just a few and they preach rhetoric and, and they teach cultic doctrine, false doctrine. And so tonight we're going to deal with the marks of true fellowship in relation to truth. I'd like you to turn to verses 18 to 29 and we're going to look at some things and uh, some very interesting things tonight in relation to um, this particular mark of true fellowship. 1 John and chapter 2 and verse Number 18 says, little children, it is the last time. Now this is written in the early New Testament church probably 1900 to 2000 years ago. That's a long time ago. And yet he says, it is the last time. We are in the last time, still in the last time. The last time involves from that, that statement until this very present day and until Jesus comes. And so <clears throat> we're, in a, we're in a time that was connected to this verse, the last time, still. And it says, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time. Now, <clears throat> I didn't reference this this morning, but I will reference it now. I was going to use it in introduction, but I wanted to deal with this particular point and as a matter of introduction tonight in relation to this particular mark. In the early New Testament church, in this particular writing by the Apostle John, there was a doctrine that was circulating throughout the, the community of the Jewish people and, and, and in Rome and in, in, the part, in different parts of, of the, the world where Christianity was, was being preached. That Jesus was not, did not have a body. That he was not real. That he was only here in spirit. And there are some religions that preach that and teach that today. And so, <clears throat> John addresses this. And I want you to leave your finger in chapter 2 right now. And I want you to go back to chapter 1. And I want you to... You, it, it will make sense to you why he is referencing these specific, specific things about the Lord Jesus. As he, as he addresses the truth and he addresses the doctrine of Jesus' humanity that he was indeed who he claimed to be, that he was God in human flesh. God that had become man, the God-man, the, the mediator between God and man, the man, Christ, Jesus. So verse 1, he begins in chapter 1 and he says, that which, we have, which was from the beginning, so he references his deity and his eternity, which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Amen. And so he, he brings several physical aspects. 
You would not be able to hear unless he had a voice. You would not be able to see unless he had a body. You wouldn't be able to, to touch him and handle him unless he was physical. And folks, if we don't have a real Savior, if, we didn't, if all he was was just a spook or a spirit floating around in space, we don't have eternal life. We don't have salvation. We don't have forgiveness of sin. We have nothing but a dead, dull, dry religion, lifeless and worthless without a real God in a real human body dying on a real cross and shedding real blood that God's atonement could be made. And so the test or the, the mark of truth found in verses 18 to 29 John is very specific with in that Christ truthfully and doctrinally was a real person. He wasn't a phantom. He wasn't a ghost. Uh, there, there are some that <clears throat> pose, and it, it just it's crazy that when he hung on the cross that he wasn't really real and it was all just, it, it, it was all just a put on and, and it was fake, phony. Uh, Christ suffered unmercifully for us. And the, the despicable mind that would ever purport something like that truth that, or that thought that, that God would, would fake an exercise. If Jesus was not who he claimed to be, and if he did not have the body that he, the, the scriptures says he had, all the types of the Old Testament, all the symbols of the scriptures, and all, all of the, the things that pointed to Christ would be absolutely a lie. And this book would have no, no meaning to it and would be, would be just a bunch of stories. They're not just stories. This is human history. This, these are real events. And so, <clears throat> the mark of true fellowship is what you believe about the God of the book called the Word of God. God reveals Himself to us in His Word, which is truth. Turn to, to John 17, 17. John referencing Again, the importance of truth and the importance of the Word of God. John chapter 17, in verse 17, he is quoting the Lord Jesus Christ as he is praying to the Heavenly Father in his great prayer of John 17. In verse 17, he says, he, Jesus himself says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Now, and then he emphasizes, Thy word is is truth, and this is the only truth. And so it's important what we believe about this book, that we not only believe that it's infallible and inerrant, and it is, it is inspired of a holy God, but it, that it is the only book that God ever wrote. There isn't another book. I'm sorry, Mormons, there's not another book. Joseph Smith, they're not extra books. All the other cults that are out there that add to this book, God is going to take their name out of the book of life. They're going to be judged by a holy God because God takes a dim view of anybody that messes with His Word. The severest of judgments come upon those who tamper with His Word. To, to tamper with His Word is to call God a liar. To deceive something about, to deceive someone about what God, God really said is to be a liar. And the Bible says, let God be true, and every man a liar. <clears throat> so we, we cannot believe lies and have fellowship with God. Now that seems pretty basic and pretty obvious to most of us, but you would be surprised at, at people who just accept things and don't think it's a big deal. They hear things on the radio, or they hear things on, on the television. They read things in books, never checking it, 
with the Word of God. What you believe as far as God's, what God's Word says in relation to the Lord Jesus Christ especially is, is vital to your personal walk and relationship with God. John warns about the anti-Christian teachers already in the world. And he tells us how to recognize them. And here's number one. I want you to, if you want to write some notes here, write these down. In verse 19, he tells us that they have left the fellowship of the truth. They've checked out with God. They, they have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. Because they really don't know God. They're self-proclaimed biblical teachers from their perspective, but really they are false. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. They're angels of light. Satan is called an angel of light. They make it look like they are saved. Make it look like what they believe is true but they really preached lies. So first, they've left the fellowship of the truth. Verse 19 says in verse 2, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out. It means they left the doctrines of the church. They left the truth of Scripture, and they came out of the church. You would be amazed at how many false teachers today were raised in a gospel-preaching church. And they, they just refuse to accept it. And, and then there, there are those that intellectually get so, so smart from their perspective that they become hypercritical of the Word of God and they, they leave the truth. They begin to write their own truth, write their own philosophies. They went out from us, but they were not of us. Then it says, for if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. They would have stayed with the faith. They would have stayed with the gospel. They wouldn't have perverted the gospel as Paul dealt with in the book of Galatians. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Their true colors were shown. So the first thing in recognizing anti-Christian teachers is that they, they left from the fellowship of the truth. They have, they have no desire, don't, don't have any interest in the truth anymore. Secondly, they deny that Jesus is the Son of God come in the flesh. Verse 22, he addresses that doctrine again. Who is a liar? I, I, I love John. <laughs> He, he absolutely doesn't mince any words. In chapter 1, he calls him a liar, okay? And in chapter 2, now he just, he just straight to the point, he calls him a liar. Only one time in my life have I ever been in court. Well, excuse me, where I was a witness. I won't go into the other information. Never been arrested but going on, okay? And so I was, I was on, I actually was doing, uh, I, had, I had been deposed. I was, I was giving, a, giving a testimony and standing as a witness for someone. And I said in my testimony that the defendant was a liar. The judge looked at me and he says, you can't say that. I said, but he is a liar. He said, I'm telling you, don't say that again. I said, well, then he's very dishonest. <laughs> John just didn't, he just got right, he just cut right to the chase. And he says in verse, 20, verse 19, they went out from us. Then he says, but uh, verse 22, who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Those 
that were denying that Jesus was the Christ and that he actually was the physical Son of God were liars, and John called them out. He said, first, he said they came out of the church, they have no interest in the, in the truth anymore, and you don't need to believe them because they're liars. Number three, in verse 26, he, he also pointed out how to tell that they were Antichrist teachers. Verse 26 says, These things have I written concerning you, or written unto you concerning them that seduce you. They're very persuasive people. Go to Galatians chapter 1, and let me look. Let me, let me point out how Paul addressed the Galatians. In Galatians in chapter 1. <clears throat> Galatians and then Ephesians and Philippians. Galatians following 2 Corinthians. He writes in verse 6, I marvel... That, they, that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there, there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which, you have, we have pre that, than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I, now, do, do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then he continues on. And so these, these people seduce people to their way of thinking, perverting the minds of people to truth. And John says, don't buy it. Don't buy what they're selling. They're liars. They're seducers. They don't know what they're talking about. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. John is in agreement with what Peter says in chapter 2 of 2 Peter 2. Both of them scathe false religion in both of these texts. 2 Peter chapter 2 says, But there were false prophets also, now look at this, among the people. even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies. Now, now I'm not talking about minor things. I, I'm talking tonight about major doctrines. They're gray areas. There are things that you know, we dogmatically cannot, cannot say, and there, is, there are other things that, that we we differ with, but don't matter in this grand scheme of eternity. But there, there, are, there are doctrines that are fixed, doctrines that cannot be changed, doctrines that are the pillars and tenets of the faith. And when you get away from those, you get away from God. Amen. And so he writes, who privately bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift judgment or destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not. Meaning that God has not winked at it and God has not forgotten what they're teaching, what they're preaching. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, 
But save Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample or an example unto those that after should live ungodly. And deliver just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Presumptuous are they, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities, whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. But these, speaking of false teachers, are as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, <clears throat> speak evil of the things that they understand not, speaking of Scripture, and shall utter, utterly perish in their own corruption and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are in blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. In other words, they're sitting right by people. I don't know of anybody here in the church, but that doesn't mean that there won't creep in people sometimes unawares. I remember being in Bible college, and I was sitting down at... Uh, I actually was in a, a dorm room of one of my friends, and he had a roommate. And this is something I want to throw out to you parents. I want you to understand and, and know this very carefully. Just because a child goes to Bible college doesn't mean he knows God. Just because they go to Christian school doesn't mean they know God. Not everybody in a Christian school, not everybody in a Christian college checks out every kid because tuition pays teachers. And so in our conversation, this young man <clears throat> began to talk about things that he did not believe. I was, I was stunned. I was appalled. I, I was angry, actually. And, and I told him straight up, I, why are you even here? <laughs> I, I, can't, I don't even understand. why. And, and he, you know, his mentality was that, well, he was going to try to sway, every, sway everybody he could in the college. You know what? That's how wicked false teachers are. They can't get their own congregation, they can't develop their own crowd, so they're going to try to take him from God's crowd. And we all need to be aware, all the time. Not only me as a pastor, but, the, but our, you know, all of us as a congregation, and you can spot them in a heartbeat. Just listen to what they bring, what comes out of their mouth. They seduce people. The Spirit of God <clears throat> is our heavenly unction who teaches us the truth. There are some that when they read, and I'd like you to turn, if you will, uh, to <clears throat> um, second, go to, go to John chapter 14 real quick. I want to read you something about the Holy Spirit. John mentions, in verse 20, he mentions about the Holy Spirit being our unction. But I want to read John 14, 26 tonight. And I want you to understand <clears throat> that God is not discounting here pastors, teachers, evangelists. If he, was, if, he, if he didn't want them, and all we needed was the Holy Spirit, then that wouldn't be in the Bible. So, because you have the Holy Spirit, doesn't discount the necessity for men of God to preach the truth and to help to guide in truth. But what he's saying is, in your personal life and in your personal fellowship with God and in your study, the Holy Spirit can teach you personally. And you need to pay attention to that Holy Spirit that is your unction. John 14, 26, Jesus, this is a wonderful verse of Scripture. He says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. 
So the Holy Spirit, all the, all the time that the apostles were preaching, when they would forget, he would be there to remind them of, of, of the things that Jesus had poured into their life. What a, what a wonderful thing for God to do. And what a wonderful thing for God to do for us who don't have, who ne who've never had the privilege to, to hear the apostles and didn't have the privilege of seeing Jesus. But yet, he's carried on the work to confirm in our hearts everything that he showed these men whom he called. And so it's important, the mark of truth. Go to verse 20 of our text, and let me read it. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20 says, But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. The Holy Spirit gives you insight into His Word. And what that, what that means is that we all know the Word of God is true. The Holy Spirit, He confirms in our heart. He resonates in our heart that this is truth. It was breathed by God. Holy men of God, the Bible says, were, were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so he confirms, yes, this is true. I told these men what, I told the men what to write. I told them what to say. I had them write it on paper, and you're getting it firsthand not seconds and thirds, you're hearing what exactly what I told you I wanted them to say. And that's wonderful. The Christian in fellowship with God will read and understand the Bible and be taught by the Holy Spirit. Look in verse 28 and 29. And now, little children, abide in Him, that when He shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. If we believe the truth with our hearts and commit ourselves to it, then we will live holy lives before men. And so this book moves us Biblical truth moves us to holiness. Truth moves us to live different lives. Some Christians have not been abiding or fellowshipping with Christ, and when, they, when the Lord Jesus returns, they'll be ashamed. That should be our motivation with truth. What is Jesus going to think of me with what I believe. What is he going to think about what I have taught? It's important because he has said everything in this book and to deny any of it would be to deny him. Turn to Mark, book of Mark, chapter 8. Book of Mark, chapter 8, quickly. And verse 38. There's a significant statement. I want to see if you can catch it as I read it in this text. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. What three words am I, am I looking at? In that text. Shall be, ashamed. Shall be ashamed of me and of my words. It's not just Jesus that we shouldn't be ashamed of. We should never be ashamed as a child of God with this book. Every word of God is, every word is true. From cover to cover. From the first end to the last amen. Everything that God has put in His Word is, is truth. And you cannot fellowship with God unless you agree with what He teaches in His Word. Go to 1 Corinthians 6, chapter 6. 
or 2 Corinthians chapter 6, really quickly. We're just about to wrap it up. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and verse 16, or verse 15 and 16. And what conquered hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an, un, with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And so it's important what we believe. In conclusion, I'm going to leave you, I'm going to, I'm going to be just a tad over, but I want, you to look, I want you to look at the word in chapter 2 and verse 2. I want you to look at a word relating to fellowship and relating to the importance of what we believe. In 1 first, first John chapter 2 and verse 2, it says, And He is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. I want to teach, I want you to listen to this very carefully tonight. This is precious. The word propitiation is the very same word used in Scripture for mercy seat. And I want, I want you to go from there. I want you to go to the book of, of go to the Old Testament. And I want you to go to Exodus 25, verses 17 to 22. And then I'm going to tie, wrap this up in a knot and we're going to go home. Exodus chapter 25, verses 17 to 22. Exodus 25, 17 says, And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold, two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work, shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherub on the one end, and the other cherub on the other end, even of the mercy seat, shall ye make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one, toward an, one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark. And in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee. Now look at this. There, where is that? On the mercy seat. And there I will meet with thee. And I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I give in commandment unto the children of Israel. Pray tell me, what was it that went between, between the two cherubs and what went on the mercy seat every year? Blood. Without shedding of blood, there's no remission. What you believe about Jesus, what you believe about the blood, what you believe about His sacrifice on Calvary has everything to do with your ability to, to have God meet with you and commune with you without the blood on that mercy seat that He took in his, he took from the time that he died on that cross, he told Mary, don't touch me because I'm ascending to the Father. He, as the high priest, took that blood, sprinkled it on the blood uh, on the mercy seat of God in heaven between those two cherubims. And that's why the Bible says, because of him we have entrance into the holiest. So you better believe that Jesus is who he says he is. Because that blood, once it's sprinkled, Bought the presence of God above the mercy seat. And were it not for the blood, none of us would ever have the opportunity to meet or ever commune with God. Our Father, we ask tonight,